So we're just letting people in here. Welcome everyone. As you're joining, you might hear some music, some Persian music coming from Nazli's home. Uh, welcome everyone. All right. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Sari Kamen. I'm the Public Programs Director of MOFAD, the Museum of Food and Drink. It's really wonderful to have you all with us this evening. Um, now, Zayma, I'm turning the music down just a little bit. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to get started in just a moment. Uh, I just wanted to say hello and welcome you all. Uh, there is going to be some cooking during the show. As I think you all know, you got recipes. Um, someone is screen sharing right now. I don't know why that's happening, but if you are Treadway iPad, maybe please stop screen sharing. Thank you so much. Um, that was wacky. Uh, okay. Um, so please don't screen share during this unless you're Nosley. As you will see, she has some stuff to show you. So thank you so much. Um, I recommend watching in uh, gallery view or speaker view or going back and forth depending on what's happening. When everyone's on the screen talking together, it's really nice to have gallery view. Um, like I said, cameras are gonna be allowed on later during cooking. Uh, other than that, we just ask that you keep, you keep it off, you keep yourself muted. And then if you have questions throughout, you can enter them through the chat as always, and we'll do our best to uh, try and get them answered throughout the program. Um, I am gonna actually hop off tonight. I am so excited to introduce you to Nazli Parvizi. She is MOFAD's new president. We're so, so thrilled to have her. And she happens to be Persian. Um, so we just thought it would be so wonderful to have her host this evening with Louisa and Jason. So with that, I'd like to welcome Nazli and turn it over to her for the rest of the evening. Thanks everyone, have a wonderful evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Sari. And, uh, Hello, everybody. Hello, MOFAD friends. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, I'm so excited to be here with Jason and Louisa. Uh, it's a really special time for our community in terms of New Year and this idea of renewal and birth. Um, but as is becoming a bit of a, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess is becoming um, less and less of a surprise these days, we also um, come together at a real time of sadness for our country. I don't think that we could sort of start this conversation um, about this holiday that has so many influences from Asia through Europe um, and every throughout the entire diaspora without noting um, the incredible sadness of not only the shootings yesterday, but just the buildup over the last year of hate crimes. Um, against all communities. Um, this isn't about uh, Asian hate, black hate, it's about white supremacy, it's about gun control. Um, and yeah, I, you know, we were hoping for newer and sunnier days with new leadership, but there's gonna be a lot of remnants left of the last uh, few years. And, you know, we are a museum of food and drink, but I think all of us would agree that food is politics and food is political. Um, we really have done a lot over the last year to highlight uh, the sort of roots of racism, um, certainly against Asian Americans, even as we celebrate Chinese food and Chinese restaurants. So much of the birth of that world was rooted in racism of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and so I just want to take a moment uh, for everyone and just kind of just reflect on those who have died um, to reflect on any one of us who have experienced racism or hatred in our past. Um, and yeah, let's just kind of sit with that for a second. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks for letting me do that. And as I said, it's, uh, I don't mean to make a glib pivot, but this is a time of joy. We're coming off a few weeks ago, the end of Lunar New Year. Um, and there's so many wonderful spring festivals. And what I love about Nodu is what we're gonna explore with uh, Luis and Jason is just the commonalities and universalities of the holidays during this time, whether it's Lunar New Year, uh, Passover, Easter, um, Holy, uh, there's just so many beautiful traditions. And obviously we're all here to kind of think about this idea of spring and birth and renewal. So. Before I introduce the wonderful Louisa and Jason, I want to actually take some time because so many of you I think are, don't come from um, 
uh, Iranian or sort of greater Iranian backgrounds. And I want to give you a little bit of context before we talk about Nodus, uh, because some of you might be new to this and we're just curious, and I love that curiosity and I welcome you. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a Nodus 101 as best I can. And Jason, feel free to chime in if you feel like I've missed anything. Um, it's a very large history that I'm condensing to all of, you know, six slides, right? Um, but we'll do our best so that uh, folks don't feel totally clueless about where this holiday is coming from. Um, so here we are. I'll take two or three minutes on this. I want to first uh, talk to you about modern day Iran, which is very much the shape of a cat. Um, so here's the cat. Uh, and we refer to this as Persian New Year. And Luisa had actually brought up that some folks feel left out of that notion. And I think that's interesting because I think part of it for me certainly, I always call myself Iranian when people say where you're from. A lot of people in my community will say they're Persian. Um, and I think there's a little bit of a political twist in why some people choose one versus the other. For me, I'm born in Iran, I'm an immigrant to the US. And while Iran and certainly the government of Iran is not, um, certainly not representative of who I am and my values and certainly the values of most of the people I know, it is my country. Um, and Persia is something that has not necessarily existed. It's not a word um, that people use in Iran to refer to themselves. Uh, my rugs are Persian, cats are Persian, I am not. Um, but when we call Persian New Year, uh, there's a reason for it. So this is the modern day geopolitical um, map, obviously, of Iran and the surrounding uh, countries. Um, and just as a point of fact, this is where my family's from, which is Azerbaijan, where the largest sort of ethnic minority. Uh, and it features prominently actually in uh, Zoroastrian traditions. Um, ancient Iran, or what was called Greater Iran or the Persian Empire, um, spanned about this area. And this map I think is from around 600, probably at the peak of the Persian Empire. And so when we say, when I say at least Persian New Year, what it's really referring to is these um, sort of former Persian speaking lands that were part of the, uh, it's what's referred to as Greater Iran, which included the Caucasus, which included Central Asia, Afghanistan, um, uh, Turkey, and, you know, today also refers to, in terms of who celebrates, uh, the Kurdish people also celebrate. And so, the, again, the influence of Nodus goes all the way into Syria, Turkey, Iraq. Um, and so that's why it could be called the Vernal Equinox uh, celebration, but I just kind of wanted to put that out there because I think that uh, I appreciate what somebody said about sort of saying, if you call it Persian New Year, it's kind of leaving out all the other folks who celebrate. And it is a much larger swath than just Iran who celebrate Nodus. Um, the root of Nodus, I always say it's, I think it's my favorite holiday. I have family that's Jewish, Christian, Muslim, and my family personally are atheist. And similar to Thanksgiving, this is a holiday that's really a uniting force for all of us. Um, we view it as a very secular celebration. Uh, it's kind of the best of all the worlds. We get all the gifts, so we do all the feasting, it lasts for two weeks. Um, and ultimately it's something that kind of unites all Iranians for two weeks and the whole country basically shuts down. But we should also acknowledge that at its core, it is actually a religious uh, celebration. The roots are within Zoroastrianism, the, um, the religion of Zoroastrianism. And among the practicing Zoroastrians in the world, uh, this is a very sort of holy holiday. Uh, the majority of Zoroastrians left Iran after the Arab invasions or the Islamic invasions and headed towards uh, Gujarat and then Bombay in India. And they're known as the Parsi community. And that's the largest sort of group of Zoroastrians uh, in India. And then Iran and America have large, uh, fairly large populations still. Um, and what to know about Zoroastrian, it's a sort of one of the oldest religions of the world, I think only probably predated by Judaism. Um, and again, you saw that map of Iran and kind of the sort of centrality of the world was sort of in that region. And so a lot of the things I'm saying have had a lot of back and forth and massive influence. I mean, this has been a land of conquered, conquering, Silk Roads trade, um, and such a confluence of ideas, religions, peoples, tribes, and languages. So Zoroastrianism goes back uh, at its earliest known form. The roots go back about 3,000 years. And it was the first religion to introduce the ideas of monotheism and duality, which really kind of influenced Ibrahimic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Um, 
And the duality is kind of this notion of good and evil, which is something that really plays uh, a lot into Zoroastrianism, light and darkness, good and evil. Uh, and it was the state religion of the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire uh, was accepting of other religions, but for the courts, uh, throughout most of the court, it waned in and out. Zoroastrianism was what was practiced. Um, and at its core, it's a fairly sort of optimistic religion. There's kind of three tenets. Uh, say good things, think good thoughts, um, do good things. Uh, and fire, fire and water are holy elements. Fire was really sacred, as a, considered sacred as a purifying element. And that's important because of a holiday that we just celebrated two days ago. Uh, and the new year, no ruz, no is new, ruz is day. So literally the new day, the new year is celebrated every year at the exact moment of the vernal equinox, which this year is going to be for, if you're in California, I believe 2.37 or 2.38 a.m. Um, and you know, it's always a struggle to stay up. Uh, and it basically is the moment of the equinox bringing balance to the world. And then as the days get longer, it's the subsequent triumph of light over darkness. Um, and I mentioned where the largest uh, Zoroastrian communities are. Uh, and then I want to go through some of the Nodus traditions as we know them. Um, Nodus is celebrated today, as I said, by Parsis, Iranians, Afghanis, Iraqis, Kurds, Central Asians, Azeris, and other folks from the Caucasus, uh, amongst many other folks. Uh, and it's a two-week holiday kicked off about a month ago by a month of, uh, of house cleaning called Khuna Tekani. And I was speaking about this with some friends. Luisa is... Uh, half Jewish, half Iranian, I'm married to somebody Jewish. Um, and so a lot of the things that I'm familiar with through Passover, uh, you'll sort of hear little things uh, like that, such as again, the cleaning out of the house um, and the food preparations. There's such a massive amount of food. It's such a food festival for us. So the making of the shirni, the little sweets and everything, the growing of the grass, we sprout lentils or wheatgrass, that all starts a few weeks before the actual holiday. Um, and then the big thing before the actual holiday kickoff is what happened on Tuesday night, which of course is called the Wednesday festival, the fire festival, um, but is kicked off the night before Tuesday, where as you can see in the picture, uh, you light a fire and you jump over it. And again, it's that purifying element. You say a phrase, take away my yellow, the sort of pallor of winter and give me the red from the fire, give me the red glow. Um, and then as the, as the start of the holiday in Iran, um, I've never experienced it here, but I never really grew up in an Iranian community. But I wanted to mention this because as so many folks have had sort of their own reckonings within their cultures um, around race and whatnot, I did want to bring up um, this sort of character of Haji Firuz. That's a character that could, kind of goes through the streets on New Year's um, and kind of parades through the streets kind of announcing the New Year. And I always noticed it. Um, I've heard of it. I've seen it. And it always struck me as odd that there was a character that kind of had black face and was dressed all in red. Um, and I'm sort of really grateful for the collective for Black Iranians for really diving in on the academic research around this and kind of trying to bring to light where these traditions, some of these traditions come from, uh, and really introducing me to this history that I never knew about, especially coming from the very northern part of Iran. Um, about our sort of the legacy of slavery in Iran, uh, which participated in the ocean, Indian Ocean slave trade. At one time, uh, 2 million uh, slaves were brought over during the 19th century. Much of it sort of started collapsing around 1870, um, in the 1870s, but Iran did not outlaw, outlaw slavery until 1929. And sort of as a nod to uh, the British and to Westerners to kind of show that they were um, sort of joining the modern world. Uh, slaves did not just come from Africa, they've came through other, uh, there's a history of it throughout the Persian empire, but in the modern era, there were uh, slaves from the Caucasus and from the African trades. Um, and that is something I would say again, as somebody who lived in Tehran for a few years, I came here when I was five, I was completely unaware of the history of um, black Iranians. And I mean that sort of of African descent in Iran, uh, I know plenty of people now who are uh, African-American or African-American slash Iranian because of marriage and whatnot in the States. But again, I'm sort of grateful that some of the, what the sort of reckoning in America around the movement about, about black lives has kind of had all of us from different backgrounds come to terms with our own past. Um, and it really informs, I think, how as a communities, we kind of face out in this country. Again, going back to what we were just discussing about hate crimes and whatnot. Um, 
there's a, there's a lot of work we do have to do in our own communities um, before we sort of, you know, figure out, uh, uh, yeah, I guess before we kind of come to our own reckoning as American citizens. So I'm very happy for that opportunity and want to uh, share that with some of you. Uh, and then the New Year celebrated at the half scene. And this is the sort of thing that we set up, the sofre, which is kind of our setting. It's a table. Um, uh, and I'll show that to you and Luisa will show hers as well. Uh, and you sit there during the actual New Year and it's the kind of gathering place for the family. And after two weeks of just parties and travel, it ends on the unlucky 13th day. Sees death is uh, 13th and bedad is kind of to go out. Sees death bedad, which what you do on the 13th day to chase away the unlucky day is everybody goes out on a picnic. They take the wheatgrass that they grew. You make some wishes, you throw that into the water. And that's a way of, again, just kind of taking the symbol of rebirth and renewal and sending it right back for the next year. Um, and that's it. And then the traditionally uh, gifts and money are exchanged. You always wear brand new clothing. It's a time, you know, all the best things come out for New Year's. And alms are often given to the poor, to charities throughout Iran. Um, maybe again, similar to what is done during Christmas time. And the half scene, I want to sort of take everyone over. Um, it's a it's called the seven S's. Seen is literally just the letter S in Farsi. Um, there's some thought that during Zoroastrian times, this was actually half sheen. SH for in Iran is its own letter. Um, and during the Zoroastrian period, uh, and I believe some Zoroastrians still do the half sheen. Uh, one of the reasons why it might have switched over during the Islamic period is because uh, the word for wine in Farsi is shadab. Um, it's where we get the word for uh, shrub, one of my favorite sort of new fancy cocktail things that comes out. But shadab is the word for wine in Farsi. And most likely, um, it was part of this original table setting. And then when uh, uh, when the Islamic uh, sort of conquering took over and wine drinking was no longer a part of our culture, um, they switched it to the seven S's so that they would no longer have to deal with the S from the SH from Shadab. And each of the things at our tables represent, um, represent something. Again, yeah, similar to sort of a Seder table or whatnot. And I'm gonna walk over to my half scene, I believe my phone is, I think you should be able to see it um, or we'll show it or Louisa, is it okay at this point if I stop sharing and we look at your sofra? I'm going to turn this off. Uh, well, actually we'll go to the half scene after. And then this is what we're all here for is the foods of Noru's along with the half scene and whatnot. Um, you know, there's traditional foods. It's a time for feasting, but the really traditional food um, you would always serve is sabzi polo mahi, if you're farce, that's the main sort of ethnic group in Iran, uh, which is herbed rice with fried fish, cooked fish. Asher reshte, um, which is noodle and bean soup, which is what Luis is making today. Uh, if you're Turk, ethnically Turk, like my family, you would serve a reshte polo, which is noodle rice with dates and raisins. And then anything, it's such a massive feast of herbs. So cuckoos uh, with herb frittata, and then of course shirni, which is all the sweets that people spend days and weeks making. And Luisa, thank you so much for showing that. I'm gonna um, leave the slideshow because nice this is- time in one one second. Can to I just say one thing? You. Yeah, hi Jason, please. Yeah, um, Turk, Azari, Pars, Fars, whatever. Uh, we're going to be eating all of those things uh, yeah. that you that you mentioned, and a couple more. Uh, we have a smoked fish, which is a very popular thing up in in northern Iran, uh, in in the Rasht area as well. And I just wanted to show one special ingredient uh, that we put in our sabzi polo, which is fresh garlic. It looks like green onions, but this is a, a garlic bulb, and we actually cook this uh, in our pot of rice. Um, and it's just the most aromatic and uh, beautiful thing uh, that, that only really comes around for a few weeks each year. Just wanted to add that. I think that's wonderful. And yeah, and that's a great way of saying hello to you, Jason Rosanian, to you, Luisa Shef Shefia. How are you both? Hi, hey. so excited to be here. Hi, yeah. everyone. Thanks for joining us. And you were showing the beautiful sofre. I'm showing mine as well. And uh, I'm so sorry because I was doing the slideshow so we couldn't see it. But 
everyone has their own take on it. It's kind of like decorating a Christmas tree. We all have our own version of it, but all of us kind of make sure that in some form or another, the seven S's are represented as well as eggs for fertility, fish um, as a symbol of life, a mirror as a moment of reflection. Um, and then our, uh, yeah, our, uh, our various half seams, uh, vinegar, garlic, apples, um, and then all the sweets, of course, all the sweets that my mother so lovingly made. And I believe that everyone got uh, with you, Louisa, from your package. Yeah, did, did the people who ordered your boxes, did you taste any of your cookies yet? Um, because you got these kind of cookies in your box. They, these are called um, Nane no Kochi. They're <laughs> chickpea flour cookies and they, are, they have such a unique taste. They're so Iranian. Um, the, the texture it's, it's almost like a peanut butter cookie. They're very sort of dense, but they melt in your mouth and they're, they're flavored with cardamom and rose water. And they come in, uh, Nazli was mentioning all the similarities between the religions and the traditions at this time of year. And it's funny because they're clover shaped. And of course we just had St. Patrick's day. So I don't know, it's all connected. Right, and then none of them are actually made with flour, which I always think is strange too, with Passover coming up. Yeah. Rice flour, um, almonds. So yeah. again, it's a lovely confluence of so many holidays. Luisa, we're on to food. Um, Let's start cooking. Yeah, so here was the sofre. I'll just show you, I did actually do some sprouting this year. I sprouted some lentils. Mm. These might look kind of sad, but I tried. Um, and then I have some wheatgrass over there that I, that I tried to sprout, but um, I had so much fun making the sofre this year, probably inspired by us doing this wonderful event together. Well, it makes us um, also up when we lay out our own sofre, right? You still feel Yeah, it. and as Nazli, I'm gonna walk over to the kitchen, but Nazli, you and I were talking about doing our sofres, but um, Avoiding the gold that can sometimes they can get uh, get a lot of gold going. Yes. We we did our sort of more hippie versions. Yes, we have very, <laughs> yeah. most of our the traditional sofras look very ratata. There's a lot of glitter. There's a lot of gold. There's a lot of silver. Would you agree, Jason? Yeah. Um, One hundred percent agree. And actually, there is <laughs> a little bit of silver uh, in ours. Um, I, I I'd, I'd walk over there, but I I, I fear that. I wouldn't get the shot back, but yes, it, it can be a little bit blingy. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Louisa, tell us a little bit about what you're making. Yeah, so let me start this. I'm gonna actually turn on my, my heat here. Um, so I am making a traditional dish for the new year called Ashe Reshte. Mm -hmm. It's such a wonderful soup. It's basically a meal in itself. Um, but it's part of the New Year tradition. And actually, Jason and I were discussing this. I've read some places that you're supposed to have a pot of ashe reshte on the stove as the New Year turns over. And then Jason was saying that it's something that's made around that time of year and it's kind of gifted out to friends and family and also people in need. So I, I will start making it and then maybe Jason can talk to us a little bit about how like, its context is in, in Iran. Yeah. So um, it's basically a bean and noodle soup. So I'm turning the heat on this really big soup pot because it takes actually, it calls for 12 cups of water. So like a big pot. Um, so I'm gonna pour in some oil, let the oil warm up and you all have the recipes for this. And if you don't, um, have it, we'll send it to you after the show. Yeah, if you don't have it, we'll send it to you. Um, but you know, it's a few tablespoons of olive oil, let that heat up. And then as with many, many Iranian soups and stews, we start by browning some onions. So I'm gonna throw in, this is one diced onion. This is called, in Farsi it's called piaz dal. And oftentimes what happens, it's the base of almost all of our food. So yeah. what people will do is dice up 10 to 15 onions and Oof. spend like half a day frying them all and just sort of putting them in jars. Uh, and then that way you sort of save 15 minutes with each recipe because you just grab it out of the jar and throw it into the pan. Um, or if you're like me, you'll just grab it and eat it because it's a really good snack food. <laughs> <laughs> Once every, so every month so I have my onions in there as a base, but as Nasli mentioned, 
uh, I'm gonna separately make caramelized onions. Um, uh, while these onions brown, I'm gonna start on the topping because they can take a little bit longer. Um, so I'm heating up just a regular frying pan for this part. And, and like yes. The, Ash Fresh does great. And I said this to you when I saw you post some up on your Instagram. Our food's amazing. It's not the prettiest looking food, um, but I really feel like people love ashrishta. Like it's all about the toppings, right? So it's can you all about the toppings. Yes, and the top. I think the toppings make it look beautiful too. I agree. And yep. I, I just want to show you all. So this soup has four different beans in it. Now this is my take on ashrishta. I I have kidney beans, chickpeas. It, it calls for lentils, which start out raw and they'll cook along with the soup. And then I like to add fava beans. That is not traditional, mm. but I just think they're beautiful and they're a big part of Persian cooking. So I kind of like any excuse to use them. So in your, in your recipes at home, it says that you can use either fava beans or lima beans. If you can't find fava, use limas. And they're honestly really, really close. Um, Jason, Jason, what's, your bean mixture? what's your family proprietary bean mixture in your yeah what, what do you say jason chickpeas um you know usually a a, a a brown bean like a pinto uh and lentils i mean i think that's kind of the go-to mix at our house and we actually um you know we have relatives and friends that that still you know from time to time travel back and forth uh the actual noodles that my wife likes to use uh, are the Iranian ones. They're harder to get here uh, than they have been for a long time. So it's one of the three or four things that if somebody's coming to town, we always, exactly, we always ask <laughs> them to bring with them from Iran. That's right. So the, the people that ordered the no rose boxes, you got half of one of these packages in, in your box so you could make the Asha Reshte. But if you want to go out and find it on your own, the stuff that I got is the Sadaf brand. And um, yeah, they're delicious. So that's what I'm using tonight. And that's what's in all of your boxes. That's so um, my onions are browning. So I'm going to throw in all of my other ingredients. And then I'm going to show you how to make the topping. So into my diced onions, I'm throwing my, my beans. Yeah. And Louisa, I want yeah. to you did not uh, grow up sort of in an Iranian community, did you? No, I did not. Here, I'm just telling you, I'm putting in my turmeric. Oh, lovely. Always my turmeric. Almost garlic, everything. some garlic, dill. And I think that's everything to start. And I'm just going to let that do its thing. I'm going to pour in the water. Mm -hmm. You can get a look at this. And then that smell rises up from the pot of the turmeric and the dill. And then you know you are cooking Iranian food. <laughs> it's a very distinct smell. Um, inside your house, right? Yeah. And I and I want to talk about my background. I just want to show you that my pan is hot now to so start making the onion topping. So I'm going to throw in these thinly sliced onions. It's just an onion thinly sliced. Throw it in. And then in your recipes, it says to let it caramelize on high for about 10 minutes. And then I'm gonna mix in some uh, dried mint. So I'll just be doing that while I'm chatting. Um, yeah, so yes, I grew up in Philadelphia where my mom is from. And I think my parents are joining us tonight, which is really exciting. Um, my dad came over from Iran and he was a practicing doctor in Philadelphia for many, many years. And my parents met and my dad stayed in the US. So, you know, my context for no rules was really um, once a year, we would go to a big banquet hall with lots of other Iranians and celebrate. And I was, you know, inundated by, you know, these tables with beautiful, you know, piles of rice with, you know, barberries and pomegranates. And uh, there was music and dancing, like some of that great music you were just playing, Nasli. 
Um, but it was it was kind of like this a special activity we did once a year. I was not deeply immersed in that community. I didn't really learn that much about um, Iranian culture and the traditions until I was an adult and really until I dove into researching the cooking. So I'm um, I'm kind of a born again Iranian enthusiast. I, all these traditions are new to me and I, I discovered them as, as an adult and someone that grew up elsewhere. And so I'm just so excited about this food and about the traditions and um, really excited to share them. I think they're beautiful. And as Nasli was saying, they're, they're so ancient and amazingly, they're still so relevant for all of us today. You know, we can all use some, some rebirth and some renewal and some refreshing after this rough year and the tradition of, you know, throwing away those old cares and troubles from the old year. It just really resonates right now. Yeah. So if you want to see how these um, onions are coming along, I'm going to really, really brown these. Like, I'm not half stepping here. Like, I really want color on these because that was going to bring out the sugars and make this taste really delicious. So right. it still has a little while to go. Um, but Jason, I would love to hear what your experience is with Ashe Reste at the new year, what, what role it plays. Sure. So, you know, I, I think it's a, a dish that I've been eating since I was a kid, but um, that I didn't really form a true appreciation for until I, I started traveling to Iran and then living there. And this is a time of year, um, you know, if you follow, um, you know, news about Iran um, or, or just images of it, um, you know, the, the Charshambi Suri that we talked about the, that last night or the night before, two nights ago, um, you know, it, it's such a, a huge um, uncontrolled event. It's like 4th of July on steroids all over the country. Fireworks now. So it's yeah, just, it's just it's and it fires everywhere. But then after that, the cities really kind of mellow out for two weeks and people disperse and, and, and travel all over the country. I lived in Tehran for about five years. Um, and those two weeks, these two weeks that are starting uh, today, basically, uh, are the, the best two weeks of the year because there's no traffic, the air is clean, and there's just this sense of community among the people who are still there. There's no hustle and bustle. Offices aren't open. People are just, you know, going about enjoying life, taking strolls, visiting each other. And Ash, Asherah Day is just a thing that, you know, pops up everywhere. You know, you go to somebody's house and there's a big pot of it. You go to a park and somebody's, you know, maybe selling it or maybe just handing it out on the street corner. And it's like the ultimate community food. And, and as Luisa said, I mean, it's like, um, you know, a meal in one single bowl, it's very hearty, very filling, but also incredibly fresh and vibrant, right? There's so many fresh herbs in there um, and the different seasonal flavors. I mean, uh, she's making the toppings, uh, you know, there's, there's fried onion and fried garlic fried mint, which is not something that people think about. Um, so it, it really is just this unique collection of, of flavors coming together. Um, and for me, uh, it just kind of symbolizes that, that season, this season, like, like no other food. We'll be eating a bunch of it over the next couple of days. Uh, yeah. So we can skip ahead to what this soup looks like. The, the beans cook and then you throw in the noodles. And even though it, it calls for 12 cups of water, it ends up being a really thick soup. So this is kind of, you know, what it looks like. And then I like to, so, you know, this is after an hour of cooking when the, the, all the beans are tender and the lentils are, are nice and soft and it's starting to thicken up. You throw in your noodles, let those cook. And then the recipe calls for a few cups of um, coarsely chopped leafy greens. So I have a mix of some spinach and a um, little baby kale here, which I'm gonna throw in. Because I like this soup to be super green. And if you, if you haven't noticed yet, kind of the, the theme 
the theme color of Nauru's is green with, with the shoots and the sprouts and, and herbs and new growth. So I like my dishes to be really, really bright green. So, yeah, I think yeah. when you talk about Iranian food and kind of what defines it, like, you know, I always tell people because they say, well, kebabs. I'm like, well, kebab culture. No. Is <laughs> culture. Like, it's the thing you eat maybe when you go out. But yes. the defining thing for us is our ushes, our stews. Um, and I think other than Vietnam, we're the only country I know of that serves a plate of herbs. Like, you, you're so, we're so used to in America sort of chopping up some parsley as garnish. Yes. And you with every meal, every meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner, you have uh, a sabzi. And it's a combination of parsley, uh, cilantro, mint, tarragon, watercress, radishes, um, scallions. And I mean, we're like rabbits, right? No matter what you eat, you grab a handful of these herbs and you kind of shove them in at the same time as you're eating your rice or your soup. It's an enormous amount of herbs like that we consume. Um, yes. And I yeah, you need to just, correct me if my if I'm wrong, but I remember being at a an event where you were speaking, and somebody asked you what your favorite Iranian dish was, and you said, you said sabzi and paneer. I mean, just the actual, the fresh herbs, right? Herbs and bread, right? With fresh bread. Was it who I said that? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, makes total sense. I have that in my fridge right now. Awesome <laughs> feta from uh, the local one of the local Curtis markets. Barberry bread, and then I'm growing herbs in my yard, and I just I love just tucking some feta and some herbs into a piece of bread. I mean, that's all I need. Heaven. Um, and it well, anyway. So along the lines of how much we we love herbs, we also love onions and garlic mm. so much. And I feel like that's something that that's sort of maybe not acknowledged. Like, you know, we know that Italians and, and the French love, love garlic and onions, but we love those things. And, you know, they appear really, really prominently, I feel like in just about every dish, like this dish is going to get topped with onions. So, um, so here is, you know, pretty much what the soup looks like at the end. I am, I'm also gonna just throw in some cilantro from my garden, I'm just like you do. Throw it in. It barely needs anything. I'll leave the stems on there. I just want this to look really gorgeous and green. Never get rid of stems. It's it's what? a yeah, get... it's right. Oh, yeah. and actually, and speaking of herbs, Jason and I were talking. Um, so when I was lucky enough to visit Iran in 2014, Jason took me around the wonderful. Um, bazaar in Tehran that, that has an incredible produce market, which is called, what's it called, Jason? Tajrish. Tajrish. And one of the amazing things that I saw was a guy selling herbs, you know, huge mounds and piles of herbs. And uh, he had a huge machine where he would throw the herbs in for customers. And so you don't have to take the herbs home and shop them yourself. They chop them for you. Like that's just how much a part of the cuisine the herbs are. They know you're going to go home and chop all these herbs. They don't I want you to have to do they it. They heard our accents. They wouldn't let us pay either, right? I mean, they just gave us, you know, pounds of fresh herbs. <laughs> they were really nice to us. They were really nice. Um, I want to talk about two things around that, actually. One yeah, is I'm just I'm going to serve this up while we're talking because I have some onion topping that I that I already made, which I'll show y'all. Um, go ahead, go ahead, Nosley. No, it's funny. I was reading, um, Lucy and I were talking, there's this, the Instagram pan, the always pan, um, and it now comes with the Tadik trio, which I think is just so amazing that this thing that everyone loves about Iranian food, um, this thing Tadik, the crispy rice, that there's actually now something being sold to like the whole country that's kind of, is specifically made to kind of catch Tadik. Um, but I feel like it's just a matter of time. That, that dish is just so... Totally. I mean, it's just so appealing, so universally appealing. Yeah, as soon as you say you're Iranian, I feel like the automatic answer from anybody is Tadik. Not even like, what part of Iran are you from? Just Tadik. Well, that's um, a nice transformation from the way it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. You know, like, are you a terrorist or do you support mullahs or this or that? I'd rather be asked about Tadig uh, than anything. Yes. Else. <laughs> Amen to that, Jason. Yes. 
Um, one of the things I was reading, uh, what the founder of the Always Pan was that she had, her mother never taught her to cook because she said, I want to save you for bigger things. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny because similar to you, I love cooking Iranian food, but it's not the food I learned to cook in restaurants. Um, I did not learn to cook cooking Iranian food. And part of it is because, you know, as much as I always find food a form of liberation, you know, when I'm sitting there picking herbs for three hours, I'm like, this is food that's meant to keep me in a kitchen, make sure I never work for a living because I can't do this and work. Um, no, I just want to show y'all, I'm finishing this with lemon juice. Yum. To me, that is what makes all the difference in flavor because you kind of have this, you know, yep. soup with, with uh, very earthy flavors, beans and noodles, and then you pour in your lemon juice and it just kind of lights it on fire in terms of flavor. It just brightens it right up. That is the beauty. And I, I call for one third cup in, in my recipe, but it's up to you. You know, you can do it to taste however much you want. And then um, I'm going to put the topping on it. So it gets brightened up with acid from the lemon juice, but also it gets brightened up with this funky little thing that we call cash which is a fermented whey product. So it's almost like a cheesy yogurt. It's got a real funk to it. It's got a really specific flavor, um, but it is traditionally what you top off your Asha Reshte with. And if you don't top it off with that, it's, you know, you're lacking something because not only is it putting in some acid, it's also adding fat which is gonna make the flavor even better. If you can't get your hands on cash, which you, you know, it's a pretty specialty item. You can get it at a Persian store. You can use yogurt and yogurt is delicious too, but you definitely want to add that other thing that's gonna give it some more fat and some more acid. And then on top, I'm gonna to put some of my beautiful caramelized onions that are combined with um, some mint. And I, I put a little salt in those to give them a little flavor. <laughs> put another little dash of cash on there. On the and then top this off with, um, you know, a few of my fresh little things from the garden. This is some mint. I also have uh, a little cilantro. You can do, let's see, I think I have some parsley floating around in here. Any, any of the green herbs are, are great. I'm sure I have some dill floating around too. Maybe I'll throw that on. But this is basically what it looks like. It's a really, really green soup in the end. And it is hearty and it's so comforting. And I'll tell you, it's raining right here in Nashville. So this is going to be perfect dinner for me for tonight. Um, I, I want to chime in and say that I just dropped a link to a recipe for cash. Washington Post, my newspaper, uh, actually just uh, published last week. Um, yes, thank you by Nas, our friend who wrote Bottom of the Pot Cookbook, which is a so, wonderful Iranian cookbook. I haven't tried the recipe yet, but uh, I was so excited to see it in our pages. Um, I remember a time when uh, not only was Iranian food not the sort of thing that get, got covered in newspapers, but nothing about Iranian lives or people was, was covered. So, you know, it, it feels like a turning point for us. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Right. It's one thing to, it's just such a specific product. And yeah, there's something, you know, with food, like with everything else, I think for a lot of people, especially if you're coming from a place like Iran, where what you see sort of portrayed through the media is so not the experience of people who live there, who visit there. Um, and somehow I think through our food, we feel very seen. Right? Um, Jason, yeah. I'm going to ask both of you this. From a food perspective, what do you think is the most surprising thing about Iranian food that folks don't know, but also culturally as well? Jason, you lived there for five years. What do you think would surprise some of our guests here um, about Iranian culture? I, I think the first thing I would say about the culture and the people is just how um, warm and hospitable everybody is. I, I know that everybody that goes there says that, but um, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to um, uh, to accompany Anthony Bourdain on part of his trip uh, to Iran. And 
when I talk to him later about his experiences there, um, several years after the fact, he said that, that, that you know people are so hospitable. He called it a, a murderous generosity, you know, in terms of the amount of food that people would put in front of you. <laughs> uh, and it was really that that was really the case. Um, in terms of our food, I think the um, the the interplay between sweet and sour is not something that a lot of people know about. Um, and I think it's actually more of a sour food than a sweet food. I think sweet has been added to the equation in recent decades as sort of a, a festive touch and one that uh, I wish people would leave behind. Uh, you know, I, I've learned to make Fess and John, uh, which is one of our iconic celebratory dishes. Um, and I never liked it as a kid because it was just so sweet. But if you make it sour with, you know, the right amount of uh, pomegranate paste, it's just a divine, divine, divine. It really is. It's one of those things. It's walnuts, onions, and pomegranate. And it is so much more than some, it tastes like a really complex mole. I don't yeah. know how. Yeah, it is just, it is a mole. It is a mole, but with walnuts, onions, and pomegranate. And you make it from scratch. And it, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it's not a lot of work, but it's a lot of time. Yes, right? always. All of our food is a lot of time. Yeah. That's why people only know about kebabs. Right. Because... Kebabs are the easiest thing to make. That's why, you know, you'll get them at a restaurant and, you know, that a tourist would go to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have about 10 minutes food. left. And yeah. Luisa, I know you were going to maybe do a quick fish fry. And while yes. you're doing it, you might ask some of the questions. Somebody was asking Great. about the significance of the marzipan fish now that we're talking fish. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'll just start doing this and then I'll, I'll talk about the goldfish. So this is just a really simple fried fish. And fish is traditional for no ruse because it symbolizes lots of things like life and new beginnings and maybe something that Jason knows that I don't know about. Um, but I'm just making a little coating for the fish um, that is flour, rice flour and cornstarch. And it also gets a little bit of turmeric and turmeric. green and green sobs. Yeah, we can't cook that turmeric. And uh, green sobsy herbs, which you all got in your no ruse boxes. Um, so the um, the marzipan goldfish that you got, usually traditionally for no ruse, people will use a put a live goldfish on their sofre. But um, I thought that it would be a really fun solution to use one that's made out of marzipan. Um, I lived in Brooklyn for a million years and uh, I lived right by a Sicilian bakery and they make all kinds of marzipan shapes for the holidays. And they always have these beautiful goldfish. So that's how I started using them. And I that's my, my tradition now and you can, Get one of those marzipan goldfish and just keep it from year to year. They keep, or you can eat it. It's delicious. Well, I made my own because I couldn't get yours in time, but the marzipan actually is also traditional to Iran. So one of the shirni that we make, one of the sweets is called tut. My mom has been making these and rolling these. And it's basically almond flour, powdered sugar, and water. And tut means mulberry in Farsi. We have white mulberries and we have red mulberries. Um, and we're obsessed with fruit and we're obsessed with mulberries, but this is not the mulberry season. So of course you just imitated by making these little marzipan bites and they're so yes. delicious and so lovely. Yes, uh, that's right. We, you, I forgot that there's actually an Iranian tradition of using marzipan. Yeah, I mean- It's not just Sicilian. <laughs> no, I mean, Iran for a long time before the revolution was, was and I think still might be the largest exporter of um, uh, pistachios. But in addition to that, I think we probably have one of the highest per capita consumptions of pistachios, almonds, walnuts. We use it a ton in our cooking, certainly in our desserts. Um, and yeah, and I would say, Jason, when you said, I'm going to pose that same question to you as well, Louisa, but to me, the things that are unknown about Persian food, I actually think our culture of pickling and jamming, our pickles and jams. Jason, I, I know you were pulling something out, right? Show everybody. Yeah. So I just, <laughs> I have pickled um, garlic here. My, my mother-in-law, when she was um, married, got a jar of 
uh, of pickled garlic. That was about 42 years ago. She's that she's still working on that that jar and continues to replenish with with uh, with pieces of that. When my wife and I moved back to the United States in 2016, um, you know the the details of, of, of how we got here are a little bit sketchy and we could talk about those another day, but um, we had to start our own uh, jar and we're at five years right now and yeah. it's just starting to get caramelized and soft. I got a piece right here that I'm gonna pop in my mouth and it's like black candy. I mean, it's, it's just so the greatest good. thing in the world. It just melts in your mouth. This is the thing that, um, that you need next to your fried fish. Um, yes, get yes. Dessert, you need that to cut the jar, get a couple of bulbs of garlic, throw it in some vinegar, put it under the sink, start coming back to it. And garlic mostly, um, garlic mostly comes from the Caspian. Um, it's not, it's now becoming more dominant in the rest of the country, but usually the Caspian region is what's known for using garlic. And I don't know why, and it is actually true, you do not smell like garlic when you eat it there. No. That's, and that's fascinating. This beer, or if it's the garlic, but you do not reek of garlic when you eat garlic up in the Caspian. And they eat <laughs> by the clove. Constance. Speaking of garlic, I am Perfect. rubbing garlic, minced garlic, all over this fish, along with salt and pepper. And then I'm just coating it in this little breading that I made. That's the flour and the spices. And then I'm, I'm about to throw it in the oil and fry it up, just to, so you know what I'm doing over here. Louisa, what kind of fish are you using? Oh, yeah, so I got cod because it looked nice, but I made this recipe the other day with some really nice um, farmed trout, and mm. it was incredible. Um, a lot so of people problems, you know, the, the fish falls apart in, in one, when it fries. Is, is a cod or a trout or a hake or a haddock, are those good choices? Yeah, I, actually, all of those are good choices, and I can tell you because I've spent a lot of time in New England, and you can get fried sandwiches of all of those yeah. <laughs> kinds of fish. But yeah. I really, any kind of fish works well. I just wouldn't get anything that's too thick because it's just, this recipe is just a pan fry. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it should go pretty quick. But the really nice thing about this is, um, is the flavors from the turmeric and the sabzi herb mix, which is a mix of um, some fenugreek, um dried shallots and parsley and cilantro so it's really unique to to persian cooking and then you know a nice thing to serve on this to to finish it off i'm going to use limes but people would traditionally use um sour oranges or what are known as seville seville oranges and um, I went to one of the Kurdish markets here in Nashville just yesterday to try to find some, but they said the season is over. But they did have these sweet lemons, which is something that I've only tasted in Iran. And I thought, oh, maybe I can use one of those, but, but both to, to garnish the fish, but both Jason and Nasli put the kibosh on that. They said, that's not what those are used for. <laughs> so true, you could do it. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think that, and I fall guilty. I, I'm a little bit guilty of this, but maybe similar to, um, to Italian cooking, Iranian cooking is so provincial. Um, there are such specific recipes based on what part of the country you're from. Um, and then of course, within families and within towns, you know, I'll ask my mother, can you do this? No, you would never do this. The next family might do it. Um, so everyone's got their own special <laughs> which is called Advia. Um, everyone has their own sort of special bean mix in the Ashreshte. And yeah, you kind of have variations on a theme, but that really differs based on the region. The food gets spicier, which makes, as you move closer towards the South and closer towards the Pakistani border, the food gets more sour as you go towards the Turkish border where we're from. Um, that sweet sour interplay, Jason, you're talking about, the Turks are really known for, um, for the sourness. My mouth waters when I talk about it. Um, we use pressed green grapes, the juice of, of our juice um, as a souring agent. We didn't have lemons um, when my mom was growing up, but yeah. Nazi, did you just say how it's spicier in the South? Because I was lucky enough to go down and visit Bandar Abbas on the Persian Gulf when I visited Iran. 
And I had always thought that Iranian food didn't have spicy chilies in it. I was completely wrong. The food down there was spicy. Yeah. Every, it's, every dish I tasted down there was spicy. Yeah, it's a totally different, um, again, you'll have the sort of basic framework. It might still be kebabs, but the way they spice it will totally differ based on the part of the country. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, and I'm trying to think, I don't think I missed any questions, but folks are asking about where to, well, somebody said, where can I get Tadik in New York, New Jersey? And the answer is always at, at my, at one of our houses, find in Iran. Um, the, I would love to recommend a restaurant. Uh, Great Neck New York has probably the second largest Jewish Iranian population um, in the country outside of LA. And there's a, as a result, a cluster of restaurants there um, in Great Neck. There's a few in New York. There's a wonderful place and a wonderful man named Saeed um, who runs a restaurant called Taste of Persia. And yes. he just opened up again uh, for delivery. And his oh, artwork is amazing, right? Yeah. His, that's how I met him, was taking his Asherashe at Union Square Market. Yes. Yeah. Likewise. A, a wonderful, wonderful man. And I, I have to give a vote to Sofre in Brooklyn as well, which is a special place. Sofre yeah. is so wonderful. Absolutely. It is... Um, it's so, it's kind of like the, not white tablecloth, but just a really modern take on Iranian food and Persian food. And it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. Um, yeah, I'm dying to get there. I haven't been able to, and it's breaking my heart. Yeah, I know. Maybe, maybe after uh, we're all vaccinated, I can, I can actually get there. I'm dying to. Uh, so this, this fish is just about, fried up so you can see it's a really nice little yellow color from from the turmeric and um i think this little piece might be done but i'll show you you just you know drain it on a towel or whatever and then um serve it up with you know some fresh lime little fresh lime, put that right there. And then of course, of course, <laughs> of course, <laughs> some fresh herbs on top. Oh, Cause yeah. it ain't nothing without some fresh herbs. It looks beautiful, Louisa. Yeah, it's really, really yummy. Um, this is a super easy recipe. So I hope that you all, you know, we'll, we'll try these and I hope Seeing them made gives you a, a sense of confidence in making them. This is this is one of the easier Persian dishes. It's good. You need a you need a gateway. Um, yeah, it's a good gateway. Luis and Jason, I want to thank you both so much. As I said, it's um it's such a beautiful holiday and such a beautiful tradition. And you know, I Luisa, you're half American, sort of half Iranian. Jason, you grew up in Marin County. I've grew up sort of in the middle of Irish Catholic uh, Boston. Um, and, you know, we all come from the Iranian diaspora, diaspora is wide and sort of ever changing again as like we marry people from different countries and bring those traditions in. And I think one of the beauties of Nodus, certainly for me, is that it survived so many different. Um, it survived the Islamic conquest and stayed on. It survived the Russians um, kind of taking over the Caucasus and Central Asian countries. It survived within the Kurdish communities, despite kind of a secular uh, parties in Syria, Turkey, and Iraq um, trying to sort of tamp down. It is a holiday that has really been celebrated continuously for 3,000 years. Um, and I think there's just a real beauty to that and a story of perseverance and a story of adaption, right? Um, a real story of adaption of how, again, being in the middle of these sort of trade routes and being conquered and conquering and all of that, um, there's an identity that I think we're all really proud to maintain. And there's certainly a food culture. There's been a straight line for 3000 years of this wonderful food culture that we're so thrilled to share with others and sort of eager to share with others. Um, so I'm grateful to both of you Jason, for your work and sort of at very heavy personal cost of sharing the stories of Iran with the outside world as a journalist, to Louisa going through this journey um, of discovering uh, your sort of born again Iranian side and the food and your wonderful cookbook, um, the new Iranian cookbook and sharing that with everyone. Um, and yeah, I wanna thank you all. 
Uh, Norus Mubarak or Norus Pirus is how we wish everyone a happy new year. Um, and on behalf of MOFAD, again, we are so grateful to everyone joining us. Um, you know, our programs are how we survive and our memberships are how we're sort of getting through this strange year. So thank you for folks um, for supporting us, for being here, for engaging in cultures that are not your own and trying something new. We wish it was at the same table um, and it will be soon, but for now we'll, we'll, we'll see you at the real sofa, but the virtual sofa is not so bad. Um, and Jason, I think the most fun way to sort of take us out is this is like your Iranian calling card is we don't snap like this. <laughs> we do this other snap. And when you're partying, this is how you snap. So Jason, show everyone, take us out you on a good note. Yeah, there it is. I, I've never, I'm not Iranian, I guess. I can never do it. But yeah, this you is- You haven't been practicing long enough. I didn't start till I was like 25, but- A little tip, not say wet, wet your fingers. It's supposed yeah. to help. Exactly. I will try it. Um, Sari, if you'd like to close us out, uh, by all means, but I think that we've done all of it. Um, and again, we'll send out a box, uh, sorry, we'll send out in the newsletter links to recipes, to Luisa's shop, if you'd like to get spices, if you didn't get them this time around, they're all available. That's correct, right, Luisa? Yeah, spices, and um, I took the cookies down because we got maxed out on orders, but I will put the cookies back up too. Perfect. That's just wonderful. Thank you all so much. A very happy new year. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Happy Thanks, new everyone. year. Good night. Good night, everyone.